Hey everybody, this is Kai Weiner from Confluent. Today I will talk about streaming machine learning with Apache Kafka and Confluent in the finance industry. I talked to a lot of companies in banking and financial services last weeks and months. And I've seen many architectures where people combined event streaming with machine learning. And that's what I want to talk about today, how you can do that, architectures and the trade-offs of these use cases. I will specifically focus on fraud detection, but what you will see in this use case is very similar for other examples you want to build. So let's get started. Event streaming in finance industry is very common in the meantime. This is just a few of the Confluent customers which use event streaming with Kafka and Confluent in mission critical projects. And there's really plenty of different use cases, so fraud detection is just one of many. So what I want to talk about today is how you can leverage machine learning for two things. Improve traditional use cases. That's the things which you already have in place for many years, like for example, credit card fraud detection. That's a very common scenario and these kind of business rules and statistic models exist for many, many years because otherwise there would be too much fraud in banking. But machine learning can be used to improve anomaly detection and these kind of things to make fraud detection better. And on the other side, I will also talk about innovative use cases. So if you think about customer service and how you can leverage chatbots and automated speaking and, and speech translation, this helps automate many processes, reduce cost, and also actually make the customer happier if it works well, because then you don't have a long waiting time when you call the customer service. So there is plenty of different use cases for machine learning in the finance industry. Some are to improve existing traditional use cases and some are completely new things like speech translation or image and face recognition and these kind of things. And also, as you see here, there's different kinds of windows of opportunity. So some of these use cases are real time. Some are more like minutes and some are even hours or like batch. So Kafka is not just used for real-time processing. It can be a part of uh, other components where you, for example, do batch analytics for training a model. That's what we will see today in more detail. As I said before, as use case today, I've chosen fraud detection simply because this is the one we see most in banking and financial services where people apply machine learning and use it together with event streaming for real-time scoring and monitoring. And because it's more and more critical, as you see in this report from PwC, that fraud detection obviously is, is really important. And it's important in every single company which is related to any financial markets or services. So the use case I will talk about today is a global bank. So I can't say a name here, but we see many customers which are actually doing exactly what I describe here today. And this global bank is building a fraud detection infrastructure. And the situation here today is not to introduce you too much into Apache Kafka in general and how you build real-time applications. But here we really think about a setup where we already have the infrastructure in place and want to do fraud detection on an existing instant payment infrastructure. So I will not cover how to set up the initial instant payment infrastructure. This is in place and based on that, we want to improve that by implementing analytic models and deploy them for real-time scoring to make the instant payment platform more secure and safe. A typical pipeline for streaming analytics looks like this. It's on a high level very simple. So you get the data in. In this case, we use a payment app like every one of the thousands of end users has a mobile app or maybe a laptop and a web browser to do transactions for banking or maybe for trading. And then you get this data into the streaming platform to do more processing on that and also again to integrate it with other things. On the one side with real-time systems like an alerting use case on the top right we you see where things could be only automated or maybe you use human intelligence if a specific threshold is reached, like everything over $10,000 is monitored also by human. And then also you ingest all the data into a batch analytics platform, for example, you leverage it for reporting and BI tools and so on. So this is a very common pipeline and on a very high level. And now let's go deeper into that and, and find out more about the architecture and implementation. Before that, I want to quickly cover what I mean with machine learning, because I mentioned that all the time, but didn't define the term. 
So machine learning allows computers to find hidden insights without being explicitly programmed where to look. That's exactly what you see in this picture here. So there's a machine which gets all the historical data and consumes it continuously to learn from that and get insights from that. And then based on these insights, you can use it for predictions on new events. In our case for fraud detection. So you take a look at all existing transactions of the history and then you correlate this and find insights and then you want to use these insights and patterns to predict in the future if something is probably a fraud or not. From a technical perspective, in machine learning, you use algorithms like decision trees or clustering, or then also the cutting edge or buzzword term, deep learning in neural networks, which can be used for things like image recognition with a CNN, or maybe an autoencoder for anomaly detection. That's the one I use in this demo here for detecting anomalies and payments. But it really doesn't matter which algorithm you choose, it depends on the use case and there is no single best one for, for every um, scenario. So this is on a very high level what I mean with machine learning and what we want to do today. The big problem with machine learning is that there is a huge impedance mismatch between the data science teams and the mission critical and scalable and reliable deployment infrastructure. So it's one thing to build a model somewhere by a data scientist, but it's another thing to deploy that in production at scale and also monitor this infrastructure and keep it running 24 seven. And that's in the end also a part of what we will solve today and why so many people combine machine learning technologies with Kafka and its ecosystem. So here you see a, a common use case. So we build some analytic models, for example, for fraud detection. In this case, we use Python and TensorFlow. So this is very common. So Python is used by every data scientist, right? So they don't use Java and they don't even use something like Go or any other language, maybe not even a data science related language like R. They use Python in most cases. And then a framework like TensorFlow or maybe H2O or Google Cloud Services, whatever. The point is you take a look at historical data and train a model with that to find insights. However, the big problem then is, how do you deploy this model to production? And that's a big challenge. I have seen many customers where the data science teams built great models in Python. They were accurate, they worked well, they did good predictions, even on new data sets, but they were not able to deploy these models for real-time processing, at scale and for 24 seven infrastructure deployment. So it's not that straightforward. And therefore you have to think about this impedance mismatch from the beginning and your data science and operations teams have to work together for this. Otherwise this will not work well. And a model which is good, but cannot be deployed. It's no business value added, right? Therefore, it's also important to understand these hidden technical depth in machine learning systems. This is a great paper by Google, and it explains what you have to do to bring machine learning into production. And the funny thing is here, the small black thing in the middle, that's actually writing ML code. So that is what you see when you, when you go to a TensorFlow website and do a tutorial for writing 20 lines of Python code or training a model. So that's just a small fraction of the overall architecture and tasks to do to deploy machine learning. Because in these Hello World examples, you don't have to worry about data collection or feature extraction and data pre-processing and also not about scalable deployment and monitoring and so on. So it's it's really, that's the easy part, right? So data scientists spend most of their time somewhere else. And you have to be aware of this so that you make your project successful. Having said this, let's take a look at a few examples from scalable machine learning infrastructures where this problem and this impedance mismatch is solved. No surprise is that we see examples from the tech giants because they, as always, have these problems a few years before the traditional banking and financial services customers have these problems. So Netflix has built a recommendation engine, which has to work at scale because they have millions of users and all of them get context specific recommendations, what to watch next. And there are so many different uh, attributes and features which are used here under the hood. So it means like, who is the user? What did you watch in the past? Which uh, device do you use right now? What time of the day it is? What's your location? For example, are you in the bedroom or are you in the living room? And all of these things are correlated to train models to make the right recommendation in real time while you're walking through the movies 
and, and, and series on the Netflix app. So this is really huge and very important for Netflix. Another example is Uber. And the same, by the way, is what Lyft is doing. So for these ride-sharing services, you can imagine what happens under the hood when you book a taxi. Under the hood, a lot of calculations and correlations have to happen in real time, including machine learning for predictions. Because when you want to order a taxi, within seconds, you get an estimated time of arrival of the taxi. And you get an ETA for when you will get to the final destination. And you will get an estimation about the cost. And therefore, under the hood, you have to take information like, where are all my taxis? What's the traffic? What's the weather? And what's the historical pattern for these kind of um, routings? Um, to make the best recommendation for the taxi driver and for your customer, for the price and so on. And so here you can imagine this, this is really a great use case because it has to run at scale. So for millions of users, it has to run in real time because if it takes a long time, the users will go to the Lyft app, right? And the third part is, this has to happen in real time, at scale, mission critical. And mission critical is the important part here then, because if this is down for an hour, Uber has a problem. Not just because less revenue, but also because people will use Lyft instead, or maybe even a real taxi. And also because they will complain on Facebook and Twitter about Uber not working. And therefore, this is really mission critical, scalable, real time machine learning. And it's uh, really a, a strong example. And then from a finance perspective, PayPal is a great example. PayPal is doing so many things regarding fraud detection, so they have built a huge framework for that. And this framework, again, has to run at scale in real time for millions of payments per second. So this is three different examples from different industries to see how you can deploy machine learning in production at scale. And the interesting part is these examples, like so many others also, use Apache Kafka under the hood. Right? Because Kafka is built for highly scalable infrastructures and real-time processing. So it works well here. So let's understand that in more detail. If you don't know Kafka yet, so I, I will only give a short introduction, but I, I explain how to map it to machine learning use cases. And the big thing about Kafka is that under the hood, it's a distributed commit log. This means producers, like in our case, the banking app, sends information like about a trade. And this is sent to the Kafka brokers on the server side and is stored there. And Kafka is append only. This means new payments from different users are appended to this log, like a Kafka topic payment in this case. And then different consumers can consume from this log. Consumer one might be a real-time consumer, for example, for fraud detection. And this has to happen in milliseconds. So you have to consume the data from your fraud detection app where you apply your business rules or analytic models to predict if this is probably fraud or not, to decide how to go on with this transaction. In addition to that, consumer two might be a near real-time consumer. That's more like Elasticsearch, for example, where you ingest data in a slower way into the Elasticsearch index so that you can do text search on the historical data. And consumer three might be a batch consumer. And this might even run just overnight where it, uh, it's cheaper in the cloud to um, start my produce processes with Hadoop to create some reports on all the data of the last day. So Kafka is so great here because it decouples all the producers and consumers from each other. And that's a huge characteristic. And it's built for big data at scale. And this in conjunction with the characteristics under the hood for being a highly available system is really powerful. So Kafka is a distributed system by nature. This means it's built to handle failure automatically. You don't have to worry if a broker is down, if a disk is down, if network is not available. That's these things which are handled under the hood by things like partitions and replication. You don't have to worry about that as an application end user and developer. And therefore, Apache Kafka really provides 24-7 uptime and zero data loss at scale if you deploy it the right way. And that's pretty powerful. And that's actually not just true for the server side, but the same is true for the client side. Kafka clients also are a distributed system, highly available. And, and that's really huge for mission critical applications. And this is what it looks like, therefore. You have Kafka as a central nervous system for your event-based architecture. And this means all the producers and consumers are decoupled from each other because Kafka is not just a messaging pipeline, but it also stores the data in Kafka as long as you want. 
And therefore, consumers can consume the data when they want, how often they want, and how fast they want. And this is pretty powerful. And this is a main reason why people use Kafka in the middle of these critical architectures instead of a messaging system, which is just a queue which fills up, but it also empties the queue when someone has consumed it. And Kafka is stored as long as you want to have it stored. And also Kafka is built for scale, really for big data sets. You don't have to use it for big data, but you can. And you can integrate with any application. Not everything around Kafka is real time. You also connect, for example, as you see on the right side, to a data warehouse. Or maybe to a data lake and Hadoop-based system or Spark or something like that. That's totally fine, but the core is even based in real time and that's the huge difference. And here's now just a few examples. I don't want to go into too much detail. So here you just see that many tech companies use Kafka at really big scale. And obviously, it's not just a tech giant. So in banking industry, as I said, with Confluence, so this is our, our biggest market. So we have, we have hundreds of customers in the financial services industry, which are working with Kafka and mission critical projects. And what might be even more important, I mentioned this in every talk, is that Kafka is not just used for big data sets. Yes, it was built for scalable and high throughput, but 70-80% of projects I see are not about big data, but they're about critical data. If you imagine an instant payment platform, that's not petabytes of data, right? So that's more like maybe gigabytes, but typically a few megabytes per second. And that's totally fine, but that's mission critical, and that's why people use Kafka here. And therefore, here you see just a few examples. I also show this slide every time so that you, if you don't know Kafka well, you can really do a lot of things with it. It's not just for data ingestion into a data lake. That's what companies like Cloudera, Hortonworks, MapArt did five years ago, right? It's initial pitch for Kafka. But today, this is an edge use case, maybe 5% of use cases. What you use Kafka for is building mission critical applications. <coughs> Excuse me. And therefore, now let's map Apache Kafka to the machine learning infrastructure. How do they relate to each other? And that's exactly what you see in this picture here. So if you think about machine learning, it's two things. It's model training on historical data, and then it's model deployment for predictions. For model training, you have to ingest historical data from different systems and store it somewhere to train the models on top of that. And if you have big data or if you need to do a reliable integration, that's what Kafka is used for. And you can ingest the data in real time for model training. And then also for production deployments, obviously that's what Kafka is good for because it allows to build highly scalable and mission critical clients which can do scoring in real time. And also then the whole monitoring system around this can be used with Kafka if you have it in place anyway. And therefore Kafka is typically not just the broker side and messaging, but you can leverage many other components. For example, you can leverage Kafka Connect for integration to data sources and data things. Because it's using Kafka under the hood, this is also highly available for high throughput and in real time. And that's really pretty cool, no matter if you integrate with a real-time messaging system or with a mobile app, or maybe with also with legacy systems like a database or a mainframe. You can even use change data capture to push events out of the database or mainframe into Kafka. And then you can use, for example, a Python consumer, as you see at the bottom right, for a model training. This is the technology for data scientist. So he uses Python and therefore he can combine the Python Kafka client together with other favorite Python technologies and APIs for TensorFlow or NumPy or whatever you would combine it with. And then on the bottom left, you can also use Kafka native client applications to continuously process data. And as part of that, not just do things like transformations or enrichments, but you can also apply an analytic model in real time in a Kafka application. So if we think back about the fraud detection use case, here is now a, a little bit deeper architecture. It's a lot of components I know, so let's walk through this on the left side. We see the payment mobile app. This is the thousands or even millions of users which do transactions and want to monitor their bank account and all these things. They send information to an edge gateway um, where you get it into the streaming platform. And then from the streaming platform, you can do different things like at the top, continuously process the data with stream processing for filtering, for enrichments, for aggregations. 
So you don't just use the data from the mobile app, but also, for example, from another database, like you see at the bottom left. You can get both into Kafka and correlate it. So this is important to understand. Kafka is not just for stateless processing and messaging, but you can build stateful applications. For example, you can correlate each new payment information in real time and correlate it with the user information stored in a database, which you ingested into Kafka and build stateful application to continuously process and correlate data. That's pretty powerful. And then also at the top middle, you see model training as one other consumer. In this case, we consume the data from Kafka to train analytic models with that, like our fraud model. What's important here, you see that I don't even use another data lake in this architecture. Of course, you could also first ingest everything into a data lake like Hadoop or S3 and train your model on top of that. In this case, we directly consume the streaming data from Kafka and train our model on top of that. Both architectures are fine. Both have their pros and cons. This is more a simplified architecture because you don't need a data lake here. And then after we've trained a model, which is still a batch job and takes an hour or so, we deploy this model into real-time applications at the top right, where you do your model scoring. And this can be different application. This can either be something like a Java application, which is more or less a fat client, or this can be something at the edge. Maybe you deploy it, like in case of TensorFlow with TensorFlow Lite, and deploy it to a microcontroller or somewhere else with C or C++. Or use a model server and use REST communication um, between your application and the model server with the models for scoring. And in addition to this, which is our key focus here for machine learning and Kafka, of course, other consumers can also consume the same data. Either all data, like at the right, where you see the analytics department with BI. They want to get all raw data for doing analytics and reporting. But at the bottom right, you also see the fraud department, which gets the alerts, so only the really critical data in real time directly from the streaming platform. So this is the overall architecture for building a fraud detection example at scale in real time. And of course, it's just one option. I mean, you can combine it with any other components you want to use here. This is just to show you how you could build it. So let's now think a little bit more about the steps to build what I have just shown you. First of all, you need to ingest the payment data. So that's when you want to train models on this data to uh, find anomalies and, and fraud. You integrate this data from the payment app with Kafka Connect and ingest it into your Kafka cluster. It's really important to understand if there is a connector for your technology, like a database or another interface, like a messaging interface. And if there is a connector for Kafka Connect, you should always use it because Kafka Connect is built on top of Kafka and therefore it guarantees throughput, real time, high availability. And you don't want to build all of these things by yourself, just leverage Kafka Connect for that instead. Another example is where we don't directly integrate with the payment data, but maybe we get it from another Kafka cluster. This is a very common scenario too for many customers. So they have one mission critical Kafka cluster, like here on the top left, where they do their real-time scoring and payments and transactions and other things. But the analytics is done on another Kafka cluster. It might even be in another data center or maybe in the cloud. So you replicate your data in real time from the mission critical Kafka cluster with Kafka native technologies to another Kafka cluster. And from there, you can do your analytics on this Kafka cluster. This one has different SLAs typically. So if your analytics Kafka cluster is down for an hour, it might be okay. The mission critical Kafka cluster can never be down. So anyway, no matter how you choose it to do it, you ingest the data as first step. And then a second step, you do data pre-processing. This is actually where data scientists and analytics teams spend most of their time because you have to prepare the data so that you actually can train analytic models. And it's not easy as it sounds. And here you do things like filtering or transformations or anonymizing data or extracting the features for model training. So this is different functions and things you have to do. And the big problem here is um, the data scientist to be uses just Python for doing that. And that might work if it's okay for a use case, but this doesn't scale well. And therefore, um, what many of our customers do is they leverage Kafka native technologies like Kafka Streams or KSQL for doing stream processing at scale for data pre-processing. So you can continuously process the incoming data for these kind of things like filtering on transformations. 
Um, and you can do that for millions of messages and you can do it highly available. That's because you use Kafka native technologies. And you can use this both for their a pipeline to model training, but also then for model scoring. And this is one of these impotent mismatches between the data scientist and the production team. And therefore, um, you have to think about this from the beginning. How does it need to scale at production? And therefore, these Kafka native technologies are great for, for doing the pre-processing of that. Or at least parts of that. You can also combine it with an ML framework and doing some things here and some things there. Here is a specific example where we use KSQL DB to do a query. And what's important here is let's take first a look at the query. In this case, we, and it's really just SQL, right? As you see, we select the payment ID and the smartphone ID and the payment details from the uh, payment information, which is one stream coming in in real time. That's the mobile data from the apps. And we actually do even a join like in a normal database with the user database, which might be an Oracle database. And we correlate this information on the smartphone ID and filter it. In this case, we only want to see the payment type Apple ID to do more analytics on that in this case. And so this is pretty straightforward and what's pretty cool. And therefore you see here, in this case, we even can do that from Python, for example, in a Jupyter notebook for rapid prototyping. This is how the data scientists can leverage these Kafka native technologies together with their favorite other technologies like Python and a notebook. The big thing is that you can use this as data scientist, but then you can also deploy this query to production later. KSQL is based on Kafka, so it guarantees high throughput, high availability, guaranteed ordering, and it's really meant for mission critical deployments, even though it looks very simple here. And therefore you can use the same technologies and pipelines and pre-processing for development and, and rapid prototyping, but also for deployment in mission critical environments. And that's really pretty cool, I think to solve this impedance mismatch. So the next step then, after we've done the pre-processing, we need to store the data somewhere for model training. So here you see, we again use Kafka Connect. If there is a connector, like for in this case, we use Google Cloud Storage, you don't want to build your own, right? So this has guarantees like exactly one semantics to ingest every single event exactly once into the cloud storage and many other capabilities. So don't build your own connectivity if there is a connector. In this case, we're storing Google Cloud Storage because we are on Google Cloud to train our models on top of that. And in parallel, not related now to the model training, but any other consumer can also consume this data from Kafka. So that's very important. That's one of the most important characteristics for Kafka. It decouples all the producers and consumers. So while you are interested in Google Cloud Storage, Another team can also consume parts of the data and maybe they need the data in real time for a time series analytics database. It's up to every team to connect to the same data. Of course, you have to think about things like role-based access control and, and security and audit logs and so on. That's all these things also Confluent Platform provides to solve these kind of questions. So after we've done the ingestion into Google Cloud Storage, we finally can train our model. So this was a lot of work to do and it has to run at scale for high throughput to ingest all the data. And now we can do the model training. As I said before, the model training, it's an algorithm. Like in this case, we use TensorFlow and maybe a neural network to, to find insights in the historical data to detect anomalies. This is, by the way, where the cloud really shines because model training, it, it takes an hour or a day and then you shut down your instances until you train the next model, maybe in a week. And here you have the extreme scale and also in case of TensorFlow on Google with the TensorFlow processing units, you have really TensorFlow native hardware to train the models. Of course, this is just now one example. You can use any other hardware or ML frameworks for your use case. So here we train our model. This takes a few hours. And then we have our model. In this case, we have used uh, the concept of an autoencoder to detect anomalies for fraudulent payments. That's our use case. Autoencoder is an unsupervised machine learning algorithm, part of the deep learning scenario, which we want to use to detect anomalies here. I don't want to go into detail into that. And it's really not important because the point is that now we trained a model and the model is a binary in case of protobuf, uh, in, in case of uh, TensorFlow, it's a protobuf file. 
In case of H2O, you can also generate Java code. And maybe with other solutions, you have something proprietary. It really doesn't matter what the point is. A model is a binary file, and that is to be used somewhere for model deployment. So that's the first part of machine learning with Kafka. You train the model. So before we go to model deployment, let's think a little bit more about other options. Because what you have seen before is that we ingested all the data into Google Cloud Storage, so kind of data lake, right? Where we stored all the historical data so that TensorFlow can consume the data from there to train a model. What you see here is another option, and this is the simplified architecture I talked about in the beginning. In this example here, we directly consume from the Kafka log to train our model. Here you see TensorFlow directly consuming the data from Kafka in real time, or also historical data in batch. And then we train our model on that. So this is possible with um, TensorFlow IO, which provides a Kafka plugin. And the huge difference or advantage is that you don't need an additional data storage like S3 or Google Cloud Storage or HDFS anymore. You can directly do model training based on the Kafka data. And this really simplifies your architecture. I'm not saying do this in every case, so sometimes a data lake has an added value, but you don't need to build a data lake just for the sake of having it. So you should always at least question, do I really need another data lake or not? And if yes, then that's also fine. But this can really simplify some architectures. So when we talk about storage and data lake, let's think about, well, many people have a data lake because they want to store the data there long term instead of using Kafka for that, which is totally valid. But having said this, you can also store data in Kafka long term. There's a, a, a big drawback with um, open source Kafka, So, however. So um, Kafka is a combination of storage and processing. This means each Kafka broker has disks attached for the storage and it's doing the processing on the broker like transactions, authorization, quota enforcement and so on. So this works well for um, moderate data sets, but if you have terabytes or petabytes of data, it gets very costly with uh, STDs or HDDs. And also scalability is a challenge because if something is down, you have to synchronize brokers. And if you have to synchronize terabytes of data, it can take some minutes or even hours. And um, so scalability and cost are two reasons why people don't want to store Kafka and want to store data in Kafka long term in many cases, especially for big data. So here's the solution for that, and the solution is called tiered storage for Kafka. This is a solution where you can store data in Kafka forever for very low cost, but long term. So this means, as you see on the right side, it's decoupling the storage from the processing. And with this, this means that the local storage of Kafka, which is like today the HDDs on the brokers, this is just a small fraction of the data, like only the data of the last hour. But everything else is sent to an object store. Like in our case, it would be Google Cloud Storage. Or it can be S3 on AWS, right? Or something on-premise with Ceph, for example. And with this, um, you externalize the storage. You make it much cheaper because object store is much cheaper. And uh, you guarantee the long-term availability. And you save a lot of dollars with that. And however, on the other side, the great advantage is this doesn't change from the consumer perspective. So your consumer, which you have today, which consumes from Kafka, is exactly the same. So there is no API changes. This is just an implementation detail under the hood, but it's really huge. Because with this, you can really think about if you need another data lake or if you want to store data in Kafka. Because here it's event-based, so everybody can consume the data in real time or later, the historical data. But you have all in one place, and, and that's really huge for some use cases. And with this, Kafka also scales much better. And because you only have to rebalance the local data and not the remote data in the object store. And, and therefore, Kafka gets much more scalable with tiered storage. And therefore, it's really important. This is not just for machine learning. But um, for machine learning, it's really significant that you can always consume all data because you want to train new models and reprocess all data for that. Think about training a new model for fraud on, and compare data maybe from January 2020 to data from January 2019. Maybe what's the pattern, what happened, to give you one example. Here's how that looks like from a configuration perspective. You still just configure your Kafka topics, but you have an additional option. So you configure to enable tiering and then you 
able how long to store the data locally. And after this, in this case, 60,000 milliseconds, everything behind that time is stored on the remote store instead. So with this now, we really have a simplified data lake architecture for machine learning and other use cases. So you don't need to build your own pipeline with that. So I've seen many machine learning projects where people have built a pipeline between Kafka and the data lake in both directions because they also want to reconsume the events with Kafka. And so this is not necessary anymore with tiered storage. And with an event-based central source of truth, um, it's really powerful because it's real time, it has guaranteed order, but you still can attach your batch processing systems like Hadoop to that. And there is this kind of cost reduction because you have one data lake on now two. And then um, some people even think about this as long-term backup for Kafka, um, especially in finance industry where you often want to store data longer but you also want to access all data, like the customer transactions. If you're in banking and build your mobile app, you want to have um, a history of the transactions and interactions of the customer. And you want to provide the best experience to the end user and customer too. And what's better for that than having all this beta, data event-based, where you can reconsume it and reprocess it and provide better information for your customer, but also for your, for your internal teams. And therefore, that's really a great option to use Kafka um, to, to build these applications and, and services on top of that. And therefore, um, with, with this kind of data lake architecture um, with Kafka, you can also reprocess the events more easily and, and, and in the way you want it. For example, for new consumers. So let's assume you have this legacy banking app and this banking app is working well, but you will replace it. So um, the old app will still continue to work, but you provide this new fancy application. So you can um, ship it and your customers can download it from the app store. And these new applications also need to consume their old events because if you want to show this fancy dashboard to your customer in a new app, it needs to have the information and in the order of all the transactions they have done in the past. And therefore the new application can consume the old data for this customer on the mobile app. So this works as completely separate from the old application. And at some point you can shut down the old application. It's also important for error handling because when you store the data even based in Kafka long term, if something did not work well, then you can fix this and reconsume the data again with the new um, fixed logic. In banking, compliance and regulatory processing is also a huge topic for Kafka. So this is not necessarily using machine learning, but in general, um, you want to reprocess um, all data for different reasons. So either um, someone from the government says, hey, um, we want to check your old data and analyze it. So give me access to that. We want to correlate it and check if everything is valid. Or in other use cases, um, you by yourself have regulatory requirements to continuously process the data in real time. That's why you use Kafka, but you can have access to the old data for, for um, whatever the reason is. And, and therefore you can also query the old data and analyze it again. So that's really huge and you can use different technologies for that, either just a Kafka consumer or maybe something like KSQL DB for simple pull queries, or you can even integrate with other BI tools. So we have a lot of customers which use Rockset, for example, which provides an ANSI SQL interface on top of Kafka so that you can integrate with your BI tools like Tableau or Click or Power BI. And also now back to machine learning. And, and that's really a great use case when you have stored all your data long term in Kafka. You can train new models all on the event based data. You can consume the events again and again and again. In Kafka, the events have a timestamp and they have a guaranteed order. So even if you train models later on the same data, you can be sure that it's the same data like before. So either you train different models with the same framework like TensorFlow, or you want to train one model with TensorFlow, but then later also use your uh, the next cutting edge technology, maybe AutoML with DataRobot, to also consume these events to train a model to compare your TensorFlow model to the DataRobot model. So therefore, for, for model training and reconsuming data from the Kafka log, this, this is really a perfect use case for using Kafka as a data lake. And therefore, and with this, um, well, many people then ask, well, is Kafka really the right thing as a database and to, for long-term storage? Um, there is no short answer to this. As I just explained, you can store data in Kafka long-term. It has 
of course, trade-offs, right? So I have written a blog post um, where you can see this in much, much, much more detail about what's the advantages of storing data long-term in Kafka. And also it's important to understand the separation between Kafka server-side and client-side because you can either store data long-term in Kafka on the server-side in the logs or you can build stateful client applications where you keep the state from the Oracle database, from the user information to correlate it with new streaming payment information from the mobile app. So it's different kind of definitions of what a database is and what state means, right? So Kafka will not replace other databases like a Mongo or Oracle. That's not the goal. But for every use case, you should ask yourself, which is the right technology and what do I really need? Also, just think about a simplified architecture. And that's why I recommend to dig deeper into this tool. Now, after we've talked a lot about model training and, and storing the data in Kafka, let's think about the second part because model training is only the first part and then we have model inference or scoring or predictions, right? These are completely separated from each other. So in this example here, you see we do the model training in the cloud with anonymized data and we do the model deployment at the edge. The edge could be um, in the case of uh, a bank, it could be um, the, the store of the bank um, where you want to do correlations of the customer or it can be the mobile app where you deploy your model. So um, it really doesn't matter what do you do for one thing and what you do for the other. So you can use Kafka everywhere, of course, like I sh have shown you, um, even for the model training. Or for the model training, you just ingest everything into your data lake like you do it today to leverage something maybe like Spark ML or something like a Google Cloud service on your data lake to train a model. Separated from that, you want to deploy your model. And that's really um, where again, we have this impendence mismatch because model deployment typically has to run 24 seven at scale for real time scoring in a reliable way. And that's why Kafka is used so much for model scoring and monitoring this in real time. So even if you don't use Kafka for model training a lot, um, for model deployment, that's where more and more customers use it. There is two options for model deployments with Kafka. So many people from a data science perspective use a model server, as you see on the right. In this case, with TensorFlow, we use TensorFlow serving. But there is many other ones, like for example, you can use Seldom, which is an open source model server, which you can deploy everywhere. The point is you deploy your model in the server and it has great features like versioning and other things for the models. And then you have your application, as you see here on the left side, which does its processing in real time. And as part of that, it does a request with the input information to the model server. The prediction and the model appliance is done at the model server and the prediction is sent to the Kafka application so that you can continue your workflow. This works well and has a few pros, but also a few cons, obviously. Um, I, I will cover that in a minute. So this is one option to use a model server. Here is some example code for that. I will not walk through that, um, but I will refer to my examples in GitHub in a minute um, where you will see how this is implemented. But the point is it's really straightforward. Here I implemented this with Kafka Streams and TensorFlow Serving. And it's really just um, four things. First, you import the Kafka and TensorFlow Serving APIs. Then you configure your Kafka Streams application. Then you use the TensorFlow Serving API for doing this RPC call and handle the exceptions. That's, by the way, the hard part. And then you start your Kafka Streams application. And what you have is a highly available and scalable streaming application, which can be combined with model scoring. The other option, and that's what we see more and more, especially when it's mission critical and, and when, when you need real-time scoring at scale, is to embed the model directly into the Kafka application, as you see here. Because a model is just a binary, you can easily embed it and load it when you start your application, like in this example with the TensorFlow model. The huge advantage of this is that you have the input event coming in and then you have just a real-time streaming application, which also does the model prediction. So you don't have an RPC call to another application. It's one streaming application. And therefore, this is really how um, the best practices look like because doing an RPC call from a streaming application is an anti-pattern. 
So this is really a, a perfect um, example because this is much more robust because you don't have a communication with another system again. And especially when you want to scale it up to, to thousands or millions of events um, and have to act in milliseconds, then that's really what, what we recommend and what our customers do. And you don't have to use a stream processing engine like Kafka Streams or KSQL for that. If you are working in, an, in another technology and programming language like C or Python or Go, you can also do the same here. These are the Kafka clients in different languages and you can also embed the models in different applications. As long as the, the, the machine learning framework has an API in your language. Here's an example of this implementation. Here we use um, TensorFlow and Kafka Streams again. So um, actually we're not using TensorFlow serving, so that's a typo here. Um, so because as you see here, we just import TensorFlow API and Kafka. And then we load our TensorFlow model. So instead of doing an RPC call somewhere else, we are just loading the model directly into the memory of this single application. And then we configure the application. And number four is the most important one here now. We apply the TensorFlow model to our streaming data, embedded into this application. And therefore, this can be really then used for real-time scoring at scale when we start the application. Here is one example where we do model deployment with KSQL DB. So the, the examples before have used Kafka Streams and Java. Here we use KSQL and this is just writing SQL code, as you see here. So we create a stream fraud detection and select the payment ID and we use the payment values in a user defined function called detect anomaly. And so the idea here is that we get the stream of payment information in real time and then we apply the embedded analytic model in this user defined function. So under the hood you have to write this UDF once and then every end user can use it by just writing the SQL query here. And again, so KSQL is leveraging Kafka under the hood. So this query can be deployed to KSQL servers and run at scale, highly reliable for millions of messages per second. And this is really huge for model deployment, isn't it? So here are the trade-offs of the two options for model deployment. Here you see on the left side, um, the RPC call to model server, and you see the embedded uh, deployment on the right side. The, the, the big pro of the model server is that it's simple and it's what data science people know. They use a model server, they deploy it, it's easy to understand. Um, and also it has, and that's what I see as biggest advantage, it has many features for model serving in place out of the box, like versioning and A-B testing and support for different models and a model catalog and so on. And, and so that's really a huge part. So that's the advantages of that. However, the big advantage on the right side, as we discussed, is that if you embed the model, you have a better latency and, and you can also do offline inference because you don't have the RPC call to the model server. And the biggest advantage of the right side of embedding the model is that you don't have the coupling to another application and you have no side effects. Think about um, error handling. So if, if everything is good, the example on the left side is perfect, right? Um, but if um, the model server is not available or if you have problems with the network or if some other communication has an error, how do you handle that? And how do you handle things like exactly one semantics if you want to process each transaction exactly once? So the more components you use for this, um, the harder it gets. And therefore, an RPC call is typically an anti-patterning half kind of streaming application. But uh, as you see here, both have their trade-offs and um, choose the one which makes most sense for you. We have, we have customers which do the one and we have customers which do the other. So here is again the architecture we've seen beforehand. Streaming analytics for fraud detection at scale. And now I have mapped this to the components we used in the explanation. So on the left side, again, the payment app. In this case, um, we don't use HTTP but, HTTP, but a more modern technology with MQTT over WebSockets. So that even the mobile app is really using messaging instead of using RPC calls with REST. Having said this, many of our customers use the Confluent REST proxy to communicate with a mobile app. Because for many mobile app developers, they're still using HTTP and it's fine. If um, it's okay for you from a scalability perspective, um, then use REST and the REST proxy. It's, it's good, right? You can choose and pick what you need for your use case. 
And then in this case, we use the connector for MQTT to bring the data into our Kafka cluster. And also at the bottom left, you see how we use change data capture to get data out of MySQL. For example, you could use the open source Debezium framework, which also Confluence supports with its Kafka Connect connector to push data and changes out of the database. In this case, for the user information into Kafka. And then on the top left, we do the data pre-processing as discussed, and this can be include aggregations, like aggregate the data from each mobile payment and correlate the data with the user information from the, from the MySQL table and do something based on that. And also at the top, you see, we use a Python client and TensorFlow to consume the data for model training. What's important here is really, you are free to choose your technology. So here we use Python because the data scientists use it for the model training and combine this with the TensorFlow Python API and NumPy and so on. But then on the right side, when we deploy the model, this is done with, for example, a Java application or at the edge with C. Right? So the, the separation of concerns is important. So you can deploy all of this at scale and leverage the technology you want to use, but you're also solving this impedance mismatch between the data science team and the operations and, and app development team. And that's really huge and a, and a big advantage. And it's still highly available and for real-time scoring. And then again, on the, on the bottom right, you see, we also use Kafka Connect to ingest all the raw data into a database or analytics tool. And we even have one more fraud department here, which is also getting the alerts from the Kafka cluster in real time. So this is the overall architecture. And the last point I want to make is here, the, the big advantage is also that you only build the pipeline from the left to the right once. So you can use the same pipeline for ingestion into the model training and use also the same pipeline for doing the model scoring. I've seen too many customers which had built two pipelines, one in Python for the data scientist to ingest it into Spark or whatever, and a second pipeline for the real-time application. So you can build a pipeline and use it once, including pre-processing and other things. And again, this pipeline is often not 100% of everything, right? But it's maybe 80%, but even, or even if it's just 50%, which you can use twice for ingestion and pre-processing for model training and predictions. That's a huge advantage. And because it's based on Kafka, it's highly available and scalable in real time. As I said before, I mentioned a lot of code examples. Um, please check out my GitHub. I have a lot of different examples with Kafka Streams, with KSQL, with different technologies like TensorFlow and H2O and, and Deep Learning for J. So a lot of different examples. I also have built one with TensorFlow serving in our PC calls. And in addition to these more or less hello world examples, I would say, we also have built a very powerful example where we connect 100,000 clients to Kafka for real time streaming and processing and model training and scoring. In this example, we build a connected car infrastructure, but this very easily maps also to any kind of finance and payment information. It's the same architecture. You just have another interface instead of the cars, you have the mobile apps for the, for the payments. And last but not least, I also want to recommend this blog post. Um, if you think about using machine learning and Kafka together, um, this explains again the advantages in much more detail and also how you leverage tiered storage so that you can simplify your architecture without the need for a data lake. So one more thing is how to deploy this globally, because now we've talked a lot about um, to connect the dots between Kafka and machine learning. One last thing is um, how do we deploy this machine learning infrastructure really mission critical? So we want to handle even disaster where a, where a data center or a cloud region is down. And for this, Confluent provides a feature which is called multi-region clusters. This means that you can deploy one single Kafka cluster over different regions. So we have battle tested this, for example, in the US with having um, three data centers, one in US East, one in US West, and one in US Central. It's one single Kafka cluster. And this means that even if a complete data center or region is down, you don't have to be worried because it automates data disaster recovery and it um, does handle all the client failover for you. That's things which are very, very hard if you have separate Kafka clusters deployed in different regions and use something like Mirror Maker or Replicator in between. So with multi-region clusters, you can get disaster recovery out of the box. 
and especially for the mission critical machine learning infrastructures. For example, for fraud detection, which should never be down, so they have to run 24 seven and not lose any data. This is exactly what you can use for that. Here's an example of that. In this case, the use case of one of our banking customers was that they implemented um, clearing of payments. And so, uh, as you see at the top right, uh, bottom right, um, the clearing time from deposit to available um, with Kafka goes from five days to five seconds, including security checks. So that's why they used Kafka instead of their batch processes like in the past. However, with this multi-region cluster deployment, this also handles disaster recovery. So even if your one data center is down, you still have automatic disaster recovery and automatic client failover built into the solution. This works under the hood, so, so we cannot beat the physics, right? So there is physical challenges with this kind of deployment. And we solve this because we provide the configuration and, and to choose synchronous replication for one Kafka topic, like the payment and the fraud, and asynchronous replication, for example, for all the logs, which are the big data sets. And with this combination, you can build it highly available with zero downtime and zero data loss for the most critical information. And I think this is really huge. And um, in banking, this is really the most use cases we see which require this because for your SLAs, because for compliance, and, and, and there's many good reasons why to deploy it like this. And with that, then you really can build a confluent global eventing platform. What that means is you have different Kafka clusters in different regions for different use cases. In orange on the left side, you see the multi-region clusters, which we just discussed for disaster recovery with zero downtime and zero data loss in a region like in the US. But you can also replicate data to other Kafka clusters, like in a different region or even on a different continent. So there are many different deployment architectures. Um, another one which we see in banking more and more is really edge deployments, which means that more and more customers want to deploy a very lightweight infrastructure at the edge which means the retail stores, the banks, where they want to do local correlations in real time. For example, for um, better customer experience. So while the customer is walking through the store, you already correlate information. So when you go to the, to, the, to the person working there in the bank, he already has all the information for you and can make the right recommendation and knows about your problems and all these things. And therefore, this is more the yellow use case where you have um, a very small Kafka deployment at the edge maybe even just a single broker in another cluster because you don't have a big data center in each bank store. Um, and then you have one big central cluster where you um, communicate bidirectionally with all these, central, uh, these edge clusters. So there's many use cases where this makes sense. Um, the most interesting and critical one is the multi-region clusters for zero downtime and zero data loss. And part of this, of course, is the Sukiba removal we are working on right now. This is the KIP 500. There is good progress and we expect um, so that Sukiba can be removed around end of 2020. And, and this is really huge to make Kafka even more scalable and elastic. So um, this is also there to improve the operations burden because this makes Kafka much easier to operate. Um, this is just a detail I want to mention at the end. So um, this is huge for machine learning infrastructures, but also for any other critical infrastructure. With removing Zookeeper from Kafka, um, you will even get better infrastructures and, and the deployment will be easier. So let's conclude this with the key takeaways. First of all, don't underestimate the hidden technical depths in machine learning systems. There is this impedance mismatch between the data science team and the production team. And therefore, you have to think about this from the beginning and work together, because otherwise it doesn't help if you have a model which you cannot deploy. That doesn't give any value. You should leverage the Apache Kafka open source ecosystem and obviously also in commercial tools like Confluent Platform. Um, to build a flexible even streaming platform. There's so many use cases in banking and fraud detection, which I discussed today is just one of them. Uh, often people start with one use case or pipeline like fraud detection. And then when you have this pipeline running and production ready, more and more of the business units and teams will come and build their own pipelines, either on the same data or on other data, which you can easily onboard them. And as you have seen today, um, 
there's a lot of things you can do for leveraging machine learning with Kafka. It's things like tiered storage, it's um, native integrations from ML tools like TensorFlow IO. And therefore today you can really build a simplified big data architecture for machine learning. But most important, it's really can, it can be built mission critical 24 seven, real time scoring, no downtime. And also important, you are very flexible here. You can still combine it together with your favorite data lake and tools like Spark or something else. Or you can do more and more just with Kafka to, to make it easier to run and operate and, and more scalable. And with this, I want to say thank you for listening to this. Please connect to me on LinkedIn or Twitter and let's discuss in the future. I'm really curious to hear about your machine learning use cases in banking industry. See you next time. Thank you.